Hi, my name's Relevant, and today on the show, we have a trainer custom reverb head. Now I own three trainer heads and this is about the only one that I bought complete and it's the only one left standing that's mostly stock. Like other than the cap job on it and maybe a slight modification to the foot switch, I haven't done any mods to this amp. I found this at a hawk shop back in the day for like 200 bucks, I think 250. I also bought a cab for 50 bucks with it so I can't recall the exact price I paid but nevertheless those were the golden eras of buying trainers and being a man of culture and style that I was. I was looking for a good clean tube head to plug my metal zone into. And indeed, compared to some of the other options that I had at the time, it probably did it better. But, you know, now when I try that, I'm just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, like looking back at your old high school photos and seeing those 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 weird pants who name I forgot and the hairstyles. It's just like, what was I thinking back then? No taste, no taste whatsoever. Nowadays, I use it mostly as a sweet sounding bass head because I haven't got much use for a only clean head. And unlike some other amps, it's not really a dirt amp. If we look at the schematic, we got one gain stage, gain or volume knob, a second gain stage right into the tone stack and then right into the phase inverter and then out to the power tubes. Similarly, well, we have the bright channel over here it does the exact same thing, but just voiced differently with a single bright cap. The cathode on both these stages is otherwise the same, so they didn't really go out of their way to voice it differently. And then, you know, we have a common cathode on the second stage. They pretty much use the first preamp tube for the first stage of both inputs, and then the second preamp tube for the second stage of both inputs. So, you know, not quite like that garnet that I did where you have the opportunity to further voice the channels differently because each channel had their own tube. And the circuit is very reminiscent of a blackface twin type amp, except that, you know, the twins had some independent tone stacks going on. They would have first stage, then a tone stack and volume, then second stage, then a buffer stage, then the phase inverter. I don't have that schematic on file, so screw it. Just, just take my word for it. Over here, we have a tremolo that uses a whole tube, except it controls the bias. It controls the tremolo by literally turning the power output of the tubes up and down. And then over here in the reverb, parallel two stages of one tube driving the reverb. There is actually a reverb driving transformer right here. You're just watching me scribble all over this without knowing what I'm actually doing. But there should be a transformer here driving the reverb tank. And then we have two stages of recovery for reverb in this, whereas uh, the Fender only has one. The schematics for trainers are always up for a bit of philosophical debate because they're always a little bit different. This is the schematic for my amp and it's mostly correct except for minor differences is like there's no reverb driver transformer represented here. I think the power supply might also be different. I forget though, it's been a decade since I cracked this open. We're gonna try it again today. Now, of course, because of the kind of circuit it has, it's got the sweetest clean tone. And well, dual inputs, one's dark, one's bright. I don't know why they didn't use switches back then, why they actually had two channels. It's like, what, did they intend two people to plug into this amp at the same time? And maybe the lead player would be in the bright channel? But either way, as you can see, I have classic the jumper situation going on. Not necessarily in this case for more gain. For some reason, the bottom input is the high input and will give you more sensitivity. But then, you know, we have our dark channel. And then we have our bright channel. And what I actually do with the jumpers is I blend the two channels together, so. And then I add in some dark to fatten it up. This is a sweet sounding amp. And of course it has reverb. And tremolo. Okay, how do we do a normal chord here? 
That's not it. I am metal players. I do not play grandpa's guitars. I have no use for normal chords. I think I know one where you go like, like this right here and then, oh, that works. Of course, as mentioned, these days I pretty much use it as a sweet sounding bass amp. And plugged into my Ampeg cabs, it's 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 quite nice. Now that you've heard it, let's tear into it and see what we got. Now, one strange thing about trainers that is common on a lot of the models is the general lack of impedance selection. Like, you look at that, it just says speaker, external. So one of them's primary, and then one of them's secondary, but there's no impedance switching, and it doesn't even tell you what impedance is what. Now, I guess the philosophy here is if you match them with the trainer cabs that they're intended for, that's sorted out for you. Now, when I say I got this amp complete, I mean complete. It even still has all the tube shields. <laughs> that's often rare for a vintage Hawk Shop trainer. I did have to replace the uh, reverb wires, though. Oh, why is there... Okay. Now this is a later early model trainer head. The designs were more polished then. They actually had the chassis nuts integral to the chassis, so they were captive, they wouldn't go anywhere, and they put the chassis on these nice rails so it would just easily slide out. They designed this thing to be taken apart for service. Well then, what I found in here is not what I was expecting to find. I've been looking for this, and I've been looking for this. I knew I had them in inventory, but I haven't seen them in a while. I, I did not recall that I installed them in here. It seems I upgraded the main filter to 100 UF in this amp, which is maybe a bit much for the application. I had a bit of a bigger is better philosophy. In the stock circuit, we have a 40 for the main B+, a 40 for the screen grid, and then two 40s also for the preamp sections. And those would be in the form of two cans seen here. I have one dual 50 that does uh, the screen grid and one of the preamps. And then I put this 10 here on the other preamp. And then I made the main B plus a 100. I have a can here that's not hooked up at all. Uh, maybe I didn't trust it. I don't remember. I thought that can was active. The uh, power supply circuit's mostly similar. Well, we have our uh, full wave rectifier right here, or our bridge rectifier, I should say, and that's this guy here. But we do not have the separate power supply circuit for the uh, bias. Instead, we have it tapped off the full wave via a capacitive dropper. That's interesting. That's actually not a bad way of doing things. I don't know why amp makers don't do that more often, but I've never really seen it before in any other amps. It is a Sprig Orange .047, and it does not look period correct. And then, of course, the main bias can here has been replaced, but there's only one of them. Usually, we have a resistor and then two bias capacitors. Most every amp has two bias capacitors, but I guess maybe we don't need it with a capacitive dropper circuit. Over at Tube World, I have a couple 1 ohm current sense resistors going to this bias test jack so I can plug in my meter. And of course, I have an adjustable bias pot right here. Then I upgraded the screen grids. Those are actually 1.5Ks because I didn't have access to 1Ks at the time. And they've worked fine. I'm not going to bother changing those. They've been good for, you know, a long time. They should be good for now. Over here, I wish I had these parts in stock. We have some 2525s. I think it's about time to change out those capacitors. They're cathode bypass capacitors. So for the most part, they're less affecting unless they have leakage that's screwing up with the gain structure. The way this amp's sounds I'm not too worried about it but right here oh look at that I had a 470k grid stopper to the uh, dark circuit that basically be right here after the gain I wonder why I thought that necessary oh boy 
Now on this side, you see the two capacitors I initially replaced. This one came out of my uh, JCM 800 when I recapped it. it. Well, it's probably fine. So why I didn't trust it for the preamp circuit, I don't know. I've removed these so I could sit the chassis, but uh, lately I've been enjoying Tungsol 7581As in here. That is a variant of the 6L6 and actually a 35 watt variant. Power transformer, output transformer, also kind of beefy looking. Especially the power transformer, it looks like it might be a bit bigger than the custom reverb. But always with the big transformers, these guys. And then that little guy that looks kind of, huh, crusty is the reverb driver. And of course we have six tube sockets. Six. Retubing this amp's a bit more expensive than your typical old trainer. I have this all labeled on the uh, cabinet. We have V1, V2, those are your preamp tubes. If you want to start screwing with the sound of this amp, those are what you want to focus on. This is reverb send, reverb receive. Kind of just want some good transparent tubes in those positions. Tremolo, you can use old worn out tubes in Tremolo. Heck, I have this old Mesa tube here that I think it's a form of Solvtech WA. And then, you know, there's your phase inverter. Yeah, you want your Tungsol 12AX7 or your Solvtech 5751 there. But yeah, this thing's, um, this thing's gotta go. All right, well, let us tear into this guy. I know I wanna remove this capacitor because we're, we're moving, we're putting this back to stock, if you will. We just have a couple cans. Uh, sometimes beefing up your capacitor rating can be good, but sometimes it's bad. It depends on, you know, your transformers. Sometimes you can pull too much power out of your transformers, right? Plus I need these for other projects. Nice 10 UF. Now I need to be able to get this over to one of the cans. So I need to get a nice piece of hookup wire. All right, are any of these long enough? Oh, they might fall just a bit short, sir. Do I have a longer piece? This one's slightly longer. If we run the wire intelligently, I think we can get it there. All right, looks like I'll be able to get that wire to reach. Uh, this guy here is getting replaced with a, a dual, uh, a 32, 32, brand new fresh. Original spec in the schematic calls for a dual 40 in all these positions. This one's a dual 50. The next one's gonna be a dual 30. Uh, kind of split the difference. Don't quite need 40 for the front positions, which is the reason why I got away with uh, what I had in there before. I'm gonna pop that in and secure it. The only thing is I might change the grounding scheme a little bit. Means I'm gonna need some more wire. So we wanna get dish guy into dish hole here. Oh, I forgot. This camera angle isn't the best for what I'm doing here, is it? Now, are we gonna get into this hole over here? Okay, that's in there. Where's the next guy we have to do? We should pop this guy out. He doesn't belong there. Not anymore, anyway. Should I bother with proper wrenches? Should I make sure this is discharged? Oh, it looks roomier here now. So where's this wire going? Okay, that's going to the phase inverter. So that wire should move down here. Now this is simple enough, or is it? We've detached from our voltage supply. Okay, so that's main right there. That's where our main B plus has to be. And then that's our screen grid supply. We'll leave the screen grid supply in place. This needs to be longer. Now it looks like I'm using a fresh piece of hookup wire for this. All right, we gotta get it in this hole down, one of these holes down here. Let's wrap this around nice, sir. All right, tack that wire in there. All right, our V-plus filtration is now reestablished. And then that's our screen grid there. And then that goes through over to there. Ah, yes, off the B-plus is this 5,000 ohm. Uh, that's that guy right there. And then that goes to one of these. So that's after the 33K here. This is before the 33K. We need to get that to here and bind it with this wire. So we'll get that wire to place anyway. Even though maybe we should just put it back over there in that hole where it once was. Let's clean out that hole and get a couple pieces of wire in it. Fuse them together and get it connected to the terminal. All right, now we just have to ground that cap and we're done, which is subject to controversy because we have a star ground here. And that's traditionally how it would have been done because you know, they just, the old caps just grounded to the chassis. But modern design dictates that this should be grounded somewhere over here on the other side where the actual circuit is. So that, you know, you're not pulling ground all the way across all this tomfoolery. So we have these two ground points here attached to the chassis. And this one here is pretty much, that's on the reverb circuit. And what's grounding out the actual preamp? Where's our cathodes? There's our main cathodes. 
they're grounded right to the jacks. There's our other cathodes. That's ground to the chassis. We just have ground points everywhere, bud. Uh, I think it's diminishing gains. We'll just uh, stick with the typical star ground and go from there. Like, I think we got more work to be done to this amp to make it like completely modern, hush, hush, quiet. It's got a little bit of hum, but it's not obnoxious. Like it's really quite quiet for its age. So I'm not too worried about it. So yeah, our grounding's done now. Oh, wait, where's this guy go? It goes here. <laughs> That's part of the preamp power circuit, right? Wouldn't that be funny? Go to test the amp. Oh, it's not working. We got no power to your preamp, bud. What'd you expect? Finagle that wire back in there. Yeah. Well, I guess we can give her a quick plug in and see what happens. Oh, my speaker wire just reaches. Boom, explosions. Nope. Oh, we're getting no sound. All right, what did I mess up? Oh, we got no power tubes in there. <laughs> you know, that, that might, that might help if we had the power tubes in place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely need some power tubes or else it's, nothing's gonna work. Okay, well, it definitely works. And it's relatively quiet. There's a little bit of hum when we turn her up, but she's good. She's good. I hope you enjoyed this, because I like to work on tube amps sometimes. And I got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of interesting stuff planned. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I gotta start coming up with better Easter eggs for after the end here and make you watch all the way to the end. Oh!